Hey everybody, uh, I want to thank you for joining us. My name is Jesse Lee. I'm the online programs director here at the White House. Um, we're doing something special this week where every day we're having a blog post and a live chat here uh, talking about the year in review on a bunch of different issues. Today we're talking about foreign policy. Um, we've got Ben Rhodes here. He is, I want to make sure I get this right, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications. Um, I'm sitting here watching the uh, chat on Facebook, so if you have questions for him, go ahead and just throw them right in the chat. Uh, I'll be keeping track. I took some questions earlier from Twitter and Facebook, too. So uh, I'll turn it over to Ben to give a few opening remarks. Thanks, Jesse. Well, <clears throat> mainly I just want to take your questions. Um, obviously, I uh, laid out some things in the blog post, uh, mainly that when we came in, the president had a great uh, deal of challenges to deal with uh, abroad as well as at home. The global economy was on the brink of catastrophe, uh, obviously ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the continued threat from al-Qaeda, um, nuclear proliferation threats from Iran and North Korea that have been growing over time. Uh, there was also, I think, a, a, an alienation um, between America and much of the world. Our standing had been reduced. Some of our alliances had been frayed a bit um, over the last few years. So. In the first year, what we've really tried to do is deal with uh, a very complex range of challenges uh, that we inherited. Uh, the president, uh, as he said he'd do in the campaign, uh, laid out a plan to responsibly withdraw our combat brigades from Iraq. Uh, that plan is in progress in a, on schedule. This will be a big year in that regard because the Iraqis will be holding elections soon. And our uh, scheduled uh, withdrawal of our combat brigades uh, is for the end of August. In Afghanistan, obviously, the president uh, has been committed to refocusing on what he f feels is the central front in the war on, uh, against al-Qaeda. Um, you know, this is where we were hit on, uh, from on 9-11. Um, and he's uh, kept his commitment to increase our resources there uh, and to focus on not just Afghanistan but Pakistan where we know um, al-Qaeda's leadership has found a safe haven. Uh, we've done so. We've, we've also kept the pressure on al-Qaeda worldwide by building new partnerships with countries like Yemen. Uh, that has allowed us to degrade some of al-Qaeda's capacity, but as we saw recently over Detroit, uh, there's much work that needs to be done, uh, and we are focused on doing the hard steps that are necessary both abroad but also at home to make sure that we're securing our aviation and our intelligence agencies are working. Um, in terms of nuclear proliferation, this has been a real priority of the President's. He's laid out a very ambitious agenda uh, to stop the spread of nuclear weapons and to secure loose nuclear materials from terrorists. Um, he gave a landmark speech in Prague he chaired a UN Security Council session that passed an historic resolution in which the nations of the world signed up for the agenda that he laid out in Prague. Uh, we're pursuing a goal to secure all loose nuclear materials from terrorists, all loose nuclear materials around the world within four years. Uh, we'll be pursuing that at a summit this April. Uh, we've also rallied broader international consensus to deal with challenges like Iran and North Korea. Um, the President's engagement in that respect has helped build international unity. Uh, make clear that we're dealing with these countries on the basis of their obligations um, under the international non-proliferation regime. And I think we're in a stage where the international community is more united in dealing with these challenges, and Iran and North Korea are more isolated. Uh, more broadly, I think the president has simply tried to reinvigorate our alliances around the world. Uh, he's traveled broadly this year. Uh, I think he's uh, done significant work to restore a, a sense of common purpose and cooperation with our key allies. He's also advanced partnerships with nations such as China and Russia and India will be critical to the 21st century. We saw some progress from that effort borne out in Copenhagen. Uh, we didn't get the full uh, binding treaty on climate change that is the ultimate goal, but all major economies for the first time made commitments to reduce their emissions. Uh, and I think critically on the global economy, this is a very active year. Uh, and the president working through the G20 uh, really helped galvanize coordinated action uh, to stimulate global demand uh, to try to start to put in place rules of the road that prevent crises like this from happening again and to chart a course towards more balanced and sustainable growth. So these are all some of the uh, initial steps that he's taken. Uh, there are also some more innovative steps, I think, that we've taken in the new media realm to reach out to publics around the world, uh, to follow up on presidential speeches such as his speech in Cairo with text messaging, with social networking, trying to create connections between Americans and other peoples um, to better reflect the interconnection of our times. Uh, so I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Uh, but this is very much a work in progress. Uh, these challenges are not ones that will be dealt with 
uh, in one year alone, but I think across the board, we feel like we've moved forward from where we were when we took office. Uh, we are, uh, we're, we're pleased with the progress we're making, but we know there are going to be great challenges and, and key uh, junctures and difficult days ahead. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll pivot to Jesse and take any of your questions. All right. Uh, yeah, like I said, we got, uh, we got a lot of questions ahead of time, but uh, I want to start with uh, a question that just came in while you were talking, which is from uh, Chad Rue. Uh, he says, Mr. Rose, do you see any problems committing to the troop rollback and exit by 2012 in Iraq and Afghanistan? And, uh, you know, given the topic of kind of year in review, those are two kind of big, yeah. you know, policies of the president. How are those looking now year in? Well, Chad, it's a, obviously a pressing question, and there's no greater priority. Um, first of all, I think I'd just underscore what the president does, which uh, our troops have really borne an enormous burden in both of those countries. Uh, we've been at war there for many years, um, and many of them have served multiple tours. Uh, I think in Iraq, um, we're pleased with uh, the progress that's been made. Um, the president laid out his timeline. That timeline commits to reduce our, remove our combat brigades from Iraq, uh, by August. We'll continue a training mission beyond that, but we have an agreement with the Iraqi government to remove all of our troops from Iraq uh, by the end of 2011. Uh, I, I think that, that that has proceeded on schedule. For instance, this year we hit several key targets, such as pulling back American troops from Iraqi cities and putting the Iraqis in the lead. So our Iraq drawdown is proceeding on schedule. Uh, this will be a big year with the elections and then with uh, the end of our timeline, as I said. Um, There'll be difficult days. Uh, violence is, is far down in Iraq from where it was in the high water period. But as we've seen in some recent bombings, Al Qaeda and other, others still have the ability to uh, really take a, a significant amount of innocent life. And we want to be there for our Iraqi partners and supporting them as they take the lead in dealing with those threats. Um, so it's proceeding on schedule. Uh, we're very comfortable with where things are. We anticipate that there'll be difficult days ahead, um, but we feel like we have a clear plan and we feel like the Iraqis are getting stronger and stronger and are taking more and more responsibility, which is a very positive sign. Uh, on Afghanistan, uh, the, the theory of the president's strategy is that we need to put these additional resources in now to break the Taliban's momentum, to train up uh, Afghan security forces, while also working with the Afghan government to make sure that we're reducing things like corruption, which have eroded some confidence uh, in governance. Uh, and that this is pointed towards building up enough Afghan capacity to where they can start to take some lead responsibility in parts of Afghanistan in July of 2011. After July of 2011, the president tends to shift so that we will begin to remove our troops from Afghanistan and begin to transfer to Afghans being in the lead. But he's been very clear that he will do that based upon the conditions at the time. Um, so we feel like there's enough flexibility to obviously assess where we are a year from now, a year and a half from now, uh, and to make those decisions at that, at that period. What the president's also been clear about, though, is that we're not going to make an open-ended commitment to Afghanistan. That in order to make it clear to the Afghans that they're going to be the ones taking the lead, uh, and also to have a, a clear strategy and course that we're implementing, uh, the president felt it was important to identify that point of transition, uh, at which point we will be beginning to ask the Afghans to step forward and take some lead responsibility and start to reduce our commitment over time. All right, uh, thanks a lot. And okay, this is a question we got a lot ahead of time. Uh, we, we just got again from uh, Ellen Plotnick uh, Mayara, uh, if I have that name right. Uh, can you give us an update about Guantanamo? Sure. Um, the president uh, pledged to close Guantanamo during the campaign, uh, and he ordered uh, one of his first executive orders as president was uh, to seek the closure of Guantanamo Bay. Uh, he did so because it's in uh, our national security interest. Uh, Guantanamo Bay had become a recruiting tool for Al Qaeda. Um, it's something that they use to draw new recruits around the world. It's something that was used against the United States. It also represented a failed legal framework. Um, essentially, a lot of these cases, at Guant we tried, I think, and convicted three cases at Guantanamo in three years. Uh, so it, 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 what we were doing down there wasn't working from a legal standpoint and it wasn't keeping us safe from a security standpoint because it provided Al-Qaeda uh, with a recruiting tool. So we proceeded with a review. Uh, in order to close Guantanamo, we needed to basically go through each and every case uh, of, all, of all the uh, people who were detained there. Um, those cases fall into different categories. Some of these people have been moved into uh, Article 3, which are federal courts, where they're being tried. 
Uh, some will be tried through uh, uh, revised military commissions, reformed military commissions. The president reformed these to bring them more in line with uh, the rule of law because previous military commissions had had, had, had trouble holding up under the courts. Um, but in some of these, people had been transferred to, for instance, to third countries um, where we had assurances um, regarding uh, the kind of rehabilitation that they would have there. Um, this has been a very challenging process. Uh, there's very complex legal issues involved. Um, so we're continuing to work at it. Um, and I, the president, again, his first order of business is we need to close this to remove what is a national security danger to the American people. Uh, but we need to do so, of course, in a, way, in a way that is in line with the rule of law and that is in close consultation with Congress. So we're continuing in that process. Um, for instance, though, the president has also made clear that he's not going to do anything that endangers the security of the American people. So, for instance, he said he's not going to re release any of these detainees in the United States. Similarly, he recently announced that for the time being, he's not going to transfer any detainees back to Yemen, given the unstable security situation there. Um, uh, there, there's obviously been a very volatile mix of security threats within Yemen uh, over the last several days. So he essentially put the brakes on any transfers of detainees back to there. So he wants to work through these issues in a very, uh, very deliberate, very careful way uh, uh, in order to make sure we're setting up a legal framework that can, that can detain terrorists effectively, that can prosecute those uh, and deliver swift and sure justice um, while also removing this recruiting tool for Al Qaeda. Um, all right, uh, so one, one of the questions uh, we, we've heard a lot in the chat now is about uh, Sudan. And uh, I, I'll kind of just pick one that is you know, representative. Eric Angel, why is the U.S. providing $100 million to fund the 2010 Sudan elections when it is universally recognized that they are a sham and completely illegitimate? Well, to take, uh, I'll get to the specific question, but to take a, a broader view of Sudan, um, we, we have a, uh, a, essentially a dual track plan, which is to implement the comprehensive peace agreement between the North and the South, and to provide um, uh, assistance and to resolve the immediate humanitarian crisis in Darfur. The President's view is that these, um, these are interconnected and we need to be dealing with them both at once. Uh, that, that lasting peace and, and security for the people in Darfur, for instance, is connected to the ability to implement this comprehensive peace agreement. Um, he's pursuing that through a policy of engagement with the international community, bringing in more multilateral partners and a broader multilateral uh, a, a effort to build capacity within Sudan to advance these goals. With the Sudanese government in particular, he said, uh, we've maintained strong sanctions on the Sudanese. Um, we've made it clear that they need to take certain steps in order to have a better relationship with the United States and the international community. Uh, so those sanctions remain in place. These elections are a critical uh, step uh, in, in advancing uh, the, the, uh, the broader comprehensive peace that we're seeking there. Now, we're, we're, we're well aware that nothing that you do in Sudan um, is going to be without problems and pitfalls. Um, but we feel that, in general, our policy is by engaging, by attempting to shape outcomes, uh, by working with parties on the ground on behalf of the people of Sudan, uh, we can better achieve our goals which is to provide as much life-saving and, and dignity-providing support that we can for the people of Darfur while trying to build a very hard-earned uh, peace in what is a very war-turned part, part of the world. All right. Um, and uh, one thing that we always get a lot of questions about, um, almost no matter what the topic is, is you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, uh, that's, that's another good one in the kind of theme of the day of one year in, kind of, you know, where, where have we gone, where are we gone? Sure. This is obviously another key priority to the president. Um, uh, this is another instance where I think we need to take a look at where we were when we came in, and what's been done and where we are now. Uh, we took office, uh, the war in Gaza uh, had just come to a conclusion. Uh, there was deep um, insecurity and in, 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 uh, conflict in, in, the, in the region. Um, the president immediately appointed George Mitchell as his special envoy uh, for Middle East peace. Uh, Senator Mitchell then immediately started engaging. He spent a lot of time in the region this year. Um, the Israelis elected a new government in the spring, so uh, we really had to kind of wait until they had a government in place to begin to engage on behalf of Middle East peace. I think what the president has done uh, personally is lay out essentially his vision in Cairo and at the United Nations. Uh, of the future that the United States seeks, 
which is two states, uh, Israel and Palestine, side by side in peace and security. He's laid out some of the parameters for the negotiations that would lead to that. We've negotiated throughout the year to try to bring the parties together. Uh, again, it's been a very difficult process, as, as this always is a challenging issue. Um, we, we were able to have a meeting at, at, at the UN. We continue to work with uh, the parties to try to, uh, to re relaunch uh, comprehensive peace negotiations. We've made some progress uh, in certain areas. Uh, Palestinian institutions and Palestinian action on the security side uh, has, has shown some real progress. Um, the Israelis have taken some steps to facilitate greater um, economic activity in Palestinian movement. Uh, the Israelis also recently announced a, a settlement moratorium that didn't go as far as what uh, was necessarily being discussed earlier in the year, but represented progress. Um, so there's been forward movement, I think, from essentially where we were when we came in, which was absolute stalemate uh, in, the, uh, in the aftermath of conflict in Gaza. So there's been the forward movement. I think we would like to get to the point where we can relaunch uh, peace negotiations. Uh, and I can tell you that as long as President Obama is president, uh, pursuing a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace and Palestinian-Israeli peace uh, will be a priority of his. And this is something that he'll stay at. He recognize, recognizes how difficult it is. But he believes that it's essential to the security of our ally Israel. And it's essential to the security of the Palestinian people and their, and their aspirations for statehood. Uh, and it's essential for uh, uh, American interest in seeing that this conflict finally be resolved, uh, that we continue to work at it. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Um, let's see, we've got a, a few more kind of in the queue here. Uh, th this is one we got earlier that I thought was uh, kind of an interesting one. It's from uh, Tommy Kiefer, uh, posted on our Facebook page. He said, Al Qaeda is becoming a blanket term that applies to anyone involved in plotting conducting a terror attack against the United States. This is simplistic and dangerous, and it leaves room for impersonators with complex geopolitical goals. Please explain how the U.S. government is exploring the possibility of groups, nations, individuals using the guise of Al Qaeda to accomplish their goals. And I think you know, there's a broader question there of, you know, the kind of enemies we're facing. What what are the kind of yeah. disparate groups there? Yeah. I, I, I would actually agree um, with the premise of the question, and so would the president. Uh, one of his central critiques, for instance, of the shift that we need in our foreign policy is that we had defined this uh, war too broadly. Um, for instance, uh, his opposition to the war in Iraq was based in part on the fact that al-Qaeda was not in Iraq, um, that we were at war with al-Qaeda, we were at a, fighting a war against them in Afghanistan where the 9-11 attacks had come from, and that going to war in Iraq, where there was no al-Qaeda when we went in there, uh, was, a, was a diversion. Um, I think that he would agree strongly that we, we create uh, a goal that is bigger than what we need to achieve and probably what can be achieved if we conflate different groups uh, into kind of a monolithic enemy. So I think what the president's tried to do this year is actually refocus on al-Qaeda specifically um, and its affiliated organizations. And this is, I think, an important point because there really are, Al-Qaeda is a network. You know, it is the core of people in Pakistan and Afghanistan. But for instance, uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen it is an affiliated group within this single network that threatens the United States. Um, so in that, in that case, uh, that is not a conflation. That, that is a, 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 a distinct enemy that the United States has. But I think the president's tried to refocus from Iraq and from uh, an over-definition of what, who we're at war with. I think you'll notice he always says, we are at war with a network. We are at war with Al-Qaeda and their extremist allies. Uh, so he's actually attempted to be far more specific, both in the terminology he uses and in the way that we apply our resources. Um, that's why I think you've seen this focus on Afghanistan. This is where the, the core of the Al-Qaeda leadership is in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, that said, I, I do want to underscore for people that Al-Qaeda is global. Again, as I said, that, um, that, so that you can be very specific in saying that we're targeting Al-Qaeda and their affiliates while still facing a challenge that is bigger than Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Yemen, Somalia, uh, these are places that where, where we've seen Al-Qaeda try to establish some safe havens. So it's a good question. You're thinking exactly, I think, in line with the kinds of questions we ask here, which is how can we make sure that our efforts we keep our eye on the ball of who the enemy of the American people is, um, who are the people that we need to be applying our resources against, um, so that we do not, again, allow this mission to become broader 
than it should be? Um, so uh, this question touches on something I, I, I kind of remember being one of the first things the president dealt with when uh, he, he came into office. And one of the first things I, I, I remember hearing about uh, it comes from uh, Rob Lornov. He says, uh, does the administration have any plans for dealing with the drug cartel violence on our border with Mexico, which has at times spilled across the border? A absolutely. This is, a, um, you know, I could have mentioned this, for instance, in my introduction. I, I, we came in. Uh, at a time, the, Mexico was another one of those issues that was, had kind of come up to the top of the agenda when we came into office. Um, uh, obviously, the Mexican government has been fairly, uh, very courageous in, in uh, taking on these drug cartels, which are deeply entrenched and have engaged in, at times, pretty horrific acts of violence. Um, we have stepped up uh, a pretty significant program of assistance to the Mexican government to help them uh, deal with this effort. Uh, that's come in the form of, of specific assistance we provided to them, some effort to help them build capacity uh, to target these networks. Uh, so we've supported the Mexican government actively with resources, consultations, information sharing. We've also said to the Mexican government that we have responsibility here too. Uh, some of the guns, for instance, that are used by these cartels come from the United States. Obviously, a lot of the demand for these drugs comes from the United States. So we've taken steps on our side of the border to try to stop the flow of guns uh, southward, for instance, to Mexico that are fueling uh, some of this violence. I think you've actually begun to see uh, some positive progress uh, in this area. Um, it has been very hard fought by the Mexican government, uh, but they've, they've actually been able to start to disrupt this cartel activity, and they've uh, been able to take out some, um, some leadership figures. Uh, so this will be another one of those uh, efforts that is going to be collaborative. Uh, I think it's another effort that shows that the problems that we face are shared, that the United States needs to be working with Mexico. And I think the president more broadly in the Americas, this is another region I think he feels like we kind of took our eye off the ball in Latin America for a few years. Um, we weren't as deeply engaged in the region, in our own hemisphere, uh, as maybe we need to be. Um, and I think he's really tried to reinvigorate our relationship with not just Mexico, but Central America and throughout South America at the summit of the Americas and elsewhere, because these problems, for instance, of trafficking, uh, they're, they're fl flaring up in Mexico now, but they, they involve the entire hemisphere, including the United States, uh, right down through to, to, to uh, South America. So it's something we're working actively, and it's uh, a key issue of bilateral cooperation with the Mexican government. Right. And uh, this is something that's not in the news too much, so I, it's the kind of thing I'm happy to kind of be able to address here. But Chris Bradley asks, how is our relationship with Russia? Um, should change happen in Russia? Are we prepared to make comments on it that are responsible? And also, at present, it, how is our relationship with them? Is it hot, warm, cold? Are we experiencing better relations than we were in 2007? It, it's a great question. Um, and I actually think it's one of the uh, real successes of the first year of the Obama administration. Um, I'd say that we have a, a, a you know, very constructive working relationship with Russia right now. Again, when we came in, I think relationships with, with, relations with Russia were at a very difficult point. There had been a kind of a sense of drift um, in the relationship where we were no longer really collaborating uh, effectively on, on, on common goals. Um, obviously, this was also in the wake of uh, some very difficult issues involving uh, Russia and its invasion of Georgia in, in 2008. I think what the president has been able to do is reach out and forge a relationship with the Russians whereby we identify our common interests and work together to achieve them. Um, and from that, we can build a foundation for progress on a range of things. For instance, uh, Russia uh, is now cooperating more with our efforts in Afghanistan, allowing us to pro uh, provide some transit for, our, uh, for, for our, the equipment and, and materials and resources we have to get through Afghanistan. Uh, but most importantly on proliferation, I think you've seen a real revitalization of US-Russian cooperation. We've been negotiating throughout the year with the Russians on a new START treaty. Uh, this would dramatically lower our nuclear stockpiles and uh, delivery vehicles. Uh, this is critical in, in both you know, getting a smaller more you know, and maintaining a smaller and secure nuclear arsenal. It's also critical towards galvanizing international action behind nonproliferation. When the United States and Russia lead on behalf of arms control, it provides the basis for uh, renewed international efforts to reinvigorate the nonproliferation regime. Uh, and to stop the spread of these we weapons and to secure loose nuclear materials. 
if we're going to secure our loose nuclear materials in four years, we're going to need very robust Russian cooperation. Uh, and we look forward to working with Russia at the Nuclear Security Summit in April, for instance. Also on Iran, in the past, the United States and Iran, uh, United States and Russia, uh, were not, uh, not together, we're not speaking with one voice as related to Iran, and which really lessened the international community's effectiveness in delivering a strong message to the Iranian government about their nuclear program. Uh, through, by working with Russia as a member of the uh, permanent five members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany, the P5 plus one, uh, you've seen this kind of unprecedented unity emerge, uh, whereby the United States and Russia are speaking with one voice to Iran, as well as the United States and our traditional U European allies. And I think that has really served to increase the isolation on Iran, uh, since Russia is more of a traditional partner for them. Um, I think you've seen President Medvedev, for instance, make very constructive statements about the fact that Iran needs to live up to its obligations or they'll face consequences. Uh, I think those are uh, indications of a, a, a relationship that is moving in a very positive direction where we're cooperating on these issues of common interest around areas like nonproliferation in particular. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't still have differences. Uh, we continue, for instance, to speak out on behalf of reform within Russia. Um, President Medvedev has made some positive comments about that. Um, but we will be candid in our disagreements with countries, including Russia, but we also want to be able to identify those issues of common interest where we can work together um, because that's what it's going to take, frankly, to make progress on a host of challenges in the 21st century that really go beyond borders and beyond the capacity of any one nation to deal with alone. All right. I, I think we've got time for one more here. And um, uh, this is a pretty specific question, but I'll ask you to touch on the kind of larger topic of China and you know the president's trip there. Um, the, the question is, uh, with the recent news of this being a double-fold recession in, uh, and that China is going to have a drastic recession in their economy as well, since we are so much in debt to China, how are we going to handle the situation if they decide to call on all the money that we owe them? Now, I, I, I realize that to some extent not your direct yeah. lane there, yeah. but maybe you could talk about the kind of economic relationship in general there. Yeah, well, I mean, two, two points to begin with. Um, one, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, I, 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 we've seen reports in the papers about China having economic difficulties that, you know, it remains to be seen how that will play out. I, I don't think that there's any certainty, for instance, that there'll be some uh, worst case scenario type developments in China. Secondly, on the debt issue, um, it, it, what it is is it, it's more, an interdependence, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the, uh, there's a kind of interconnection between the United States and Chinese economies, um, and frankly, between the economies of the world. Uh, it wouldn't be a symbol, for, in, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I think, uh, uh, as them calling in debt. I think, though, what the broader point that uh, comes out of this is, is we need to be cooperating uh, to deal with these global economic challenges. We need to take, and this is what the president's done through the G20 throughout the year, we need to coordinate our actions with other governments because our economies are so interwoven uh, that unless we're acting together, we're not going to be able to sustain the kind of growth that we want to build. With China in particular, uh, you know, we've emphasized, for instance, the need for balanced and sustained growth, which is what came out of that last G20 summit in Pittsburgh, which is kind of our guiding principle going forward with global economic cooperation. And the principle of balance and sustainable growth is for a long time, frankly, the model was American consumption drove a lot of growth. Countries, China and others, built, built things and we bought them. Uh, I think that you know, what we've seen is that lead to a kind of boom and bust cycle uh, in which there was too much dependence on, on American consumption. What we want to do by balancing is catalyzing demand in places like China and other countries in Asia and elsewhere so that we're able to export more while those countries are able to broaden their middle class, essentially. Uh, so the United States, this will be a job creating uh, initiative for the United States in the sense that if we're creating more exports, if we're able to sell more goods in China and in Asia, that will create jobs at home, um, a substantial number of jobs in manufacturing and other fields. So we want to get to a more rebalanced global economy uh, where demand is spread out in different places and isn't as focused in the United States, uh, which will allow us to create more jobs at home and sustain growth over time rather than see the kind of booms and busts that have uh, been characterized in the last 20 years or so. All right, well, Ben, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I think we covered a ton of ground here, and I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. 
Uh, we're going to have these uh, over the next few days, too. We have uh, Secretary Sebelius tomorrow. Uh, I think we have our CTO, Anish Chopra, and uh, Norm Eisen from White House Council coming on Thursday. Then we have Christina Romer on Friday, and you can find a schedule for all of that in kind of the main feature at whitehouse.gov. And uh, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.